Good morning. Good morning. So last week we started looking at Gideon. We found him, and the Lord did too, in a wine press. Now, why was he in the wine press? What was he doing? He was hiding. 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 hiding and threshing wheat. Why was he threshing wheat in a wine press? Because the Midianites were ravaging the, the land of their harvest. Chapter 6 and verse 5, it says, For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, and they would come in like locusts for number. Both they and their cam camels were innumerable. And they came into the land to devastate it. Can you imagine that? I'm going to show you a picture in a little bit about where this is taking place. And think about that description. Their number was innumerable. That's a lot of camel dung. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and a lot of Midianites. So as such, the, the Israelites, uh, they take to living in the, in the mountains, in the caves. And this goes on for seven years. Every time the harvest was reaping, it wasn't like the Midianites were there all the time. They would come and go. They would wait till the harvest was ready to go. And then they'd come in and ravage the land. And they would just devastate it. And what we're seeing is this cycle again. So what does Israel do? They've been oppressed for seven years. What do they do? What's the next step in the cycle? They cry out to the Lord. But this time, instead of sending a new judge right away, God does what? He sends them a prophet. He sends them a sermon. Why did God do that? Trying to bring them back. Trying to, trying to bring them around to true repentance, okay? And I, have you ever cried out to the Lord just because you didn't like your circumstances? <laughs> oh, I've never done that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> oh, I've, and before I became a Christian, I did that all, all the time. They cry out to the Lord, but this time they get a sermon. And why did God do that? Because the other times when he'd saved them and brought them out of oppression, it didn't last. So God's trying something a little different here. They needed to be reminded of all that God had done for them. And we find out through the conversation with Gideon, uh, his conversation with the Lord, the only thing he's seen is God abandoning Israel. Yeah, he'd heard the stories about how he would brought them out of Egypt and slavery and everything else, uh, took them out of oppression, drove them, drove out their enemies. And what have they done in response? Disobeyed the Lord. But Gideon doesn't view it that way. He views it that God has abandoned them. That's a pretty strong statement. But as we talked about a week or so ago, Gideon's a young man. He's probably in his 20s. And I was thinking yesterday, even if he was 40, he has lived at a time where the land was under rest for 40 years. He'd only experienced the oppression the last seven years with the Midianites. Okay, but in his view, the only thing he had seen was that God was not paying attention to their suffering. They cried out to the Lord, and it was really about regret and not repentance. They were more interested in changing their circumstances than they were drawing nearer to the Lord in repentance. True repentance brings about true humility. You cannot repent of your sin without heartfelt humility. It is embarrassing. Remember we talked about the difference between regret and, and repentance? Regret just wants to get done with it. All right, honey, I sinned against you. Can we not talk about that anymore? That's what regret wants to do. But repentance is something else. And once their circumstances had changed and the land had rest, after some time, the old behavior comes right back. And that's the cycle that we're talking about here. Now, we know the people in Israel are idolaters. Uh, God's response to their crying out shows that they are regretful for what they've lost, and they want it restored, but they're not really repenting of their idolatry, are they? And that leads us to Gideon. In spite of Israel's lack of true repentance, he's going to restore them once more. Now, why do you think God chooses to do that? And they've already failed a few times. They've, all, they've gone back to their idolatry. They've gone back to their sin. And yet God chooses 
to reach out to them again. Why, why is that? Because he loves them. A covenant relationship. And God has a long-term plan. Where's the Messiah going to come from? And God can do this again and again to serve his purpose and his plan. So God finds Gideon in the wine press, and the Bible says an angel of the Lord appeared to him. And Gideon's kind of unsure who he's talking to, so much so that he challenges the Lord to prove who he is. How did he do that? Well, before the fleas, he, he destroyed that. He brought, well, he brought a sacrifice, and the Lord burned it, put it on the rock, and burned it up. And that was evidence number one that he was talking to the Lord. And then in verse 17, it, it, chapter 6, said, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who speaks with me. And he burns up that sacrifice. Was it wrong for Gideon to ask for a confirming sign? I don't think so. I think if you're growing up, we're in the period of time that he's grown up, you've only experienced either rest or oppression, and you haven't experienced any of the things that you were told about that you were taught about, you haven't experienced any of that. And that's why he comes up with, God must have abandoned us. So I don't think it's wrong for him to ask for a confirming sign. And like I said, he's probably in his 20s when this is, this is going on. So it made sense for him to ask God to confirm in some area of direction that was not specifically detailed in his word and in regard to something that was life or death as leading Israel into battle against an enemy. I mean, this is I can only imagine what Gideon is thinking, okay? Remember, he was found hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat. In fact, he asked two more times with the fleece, with the dew and, you know, make the, the fleece be wet and not everything else and vice versa. And then God asks him, what do you ask him to do first? Tear down the altar, pull down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, How's that for pointing a finger at you? And cut down the Asherah that is beside it. And immediately everybody knows who did it. Like I told you, if you got one child and something's broken the house, you know who did it. And I don't know if Gideon uh, fits that description, but they want his life. They want his life for tearing down the altar and the Asherah. And what does Joe Ash say to them? Hey, listen, if your, your Baal, your God Baal is so powerful, you let him contend with Gideon. And all that talk of taking his life kind of goes away. So now we're going to move into chapter seven. You got your Bibles with you. We're going to be in chapter seven um, most of the day. And it is game on. Um, we're going to look at this map a couple of times. But this is, just so you have an idea, this is where they're at. This is where they're camping out. This is the Valley of Jezreel right in here. And I don't know if they have a picture here. Oh, it's coming up. So that's where they're at. Jack, let's start with uh, chapter 7, uh, verses where are you here? 1 to 3. I'll make a quick editorial comment first. NIV 85 this morning, at the risk of being wishy-washy or flip-flopping, <laughs> I decided that most of you follow uh, with the NIV. So that's how many what people I'll be use using. NIV in here? Oh, that's a that's a fair amount. Uh, how about uh, New American Standard? Okay, and a few, and ESV, and King James. Just Bart, <laughs> just Bart. <laughs> uh, one, one in the corner over here. Yeah, just real quick about you know, uh, translations. Uh, a translation is somebody else's interpretation of the text. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of these and nows in there. And the only thing I'll say about NIV, someone told me this one time, and I think it's kind of appropriate. NIV is a thought for thought translation. They'll take a section of the scripture and they'll make it readable and maintain the thought that's in there. Whereas you get into something like NASB, it is a word for word as best they can translation in it. So sometimes it's not as readable in today's English, but NIV is just fine. We're not doing any deep uh, word studies here today. So I think the sentiment will be caught in NIV just, just the same. So go ahead, Jack. Okay, uh, chapter seven, verses one through three. 
early in the morning, Jerub Bell, that is Gideon. And uh, remember all, at the end of the previous chapter, they, why'd they call him Jer Jerubel or Jerubel? Because he tore down Baal's altar and it means that uh, Jer uh, Baal must contend with him. Okay. So that is Gideon and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moray. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands in order that Israel may not boast against me that her, strength, her own strength has saved her. Announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 men remained. Now think about this. You're, you're going up against uh, the Midianites who are innumerable, okay? Not to mention the camels. You've got 32,000 people and, and God tells him, you've got too many people. We're gonna have to thin the herd just a little bit here. And why does he do that? It says in verse two, because I don't want you boasting about winning this battle with your own might. So the first thing he does is, is if you're afraid, go home. Now, if I'm the head of an army and two thirds of my people leave because they're afraid, that means there's probably other people left that are still afraid as well. They just didn't want to say it. So he goes from 32 down to 10,000. Too many people. Let's cut that down a little. So again, he tells us in verse two, I don't want you uh, boasting about winning this victory. When this is all said and done, you are going to boast that I delivered you. I delivered the Midianites into your hands and you had virtually nothing to do with it. That's what God is looking for. But he's still got 10,000. And we see how this is different from, from other cycles. Let me go back here. So other cycles look exactly like this. But on this one, he sent a prophet first, okay? And now, and now he is going to bring them into battle and he's gonna deliver the Midianites into their hands with a lot fewer people. You think that's disconcerting to uh, Gideon at this point? You think Gideon's afraid? We're, we're gonna see that in a little bit. Yeah. he's. He's afraid. You've lost 22,000. And again, those are people who are willing to admit it publicly. I'm sure of the 10,000, there were still more that felt the same way. Now, there's a good reason to send them home. Why would you ask that question and let those people leave? Anyone, anyone? Because if you have people that are concerned, people that are worried, people that are afraid, that is going to permeate throughout the entire army. So there was a good reason that God asked that question and gets them to leave first. You don't want that. You don't want panicked soldiers to flee in the middle of battle. So we're going to do away with that. Have you ever been around someone that's fearful? What's that like? It's contagious. It's contagious. Yeah. How many people have been in the military? You ever been around people in the military that were fearful? You ever wonder why are you here in the first place? I saw a story just, just this week about a, a, a Marine who was like in a 7-Eleven and some kid comes in with a gun in his hand. He's going to do armed robbery. He instinctively, you know, takes this guy down. No fear in that guy. You know, my, my mother, I think I've told you before, is, uh, has been diagnosed with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. And one of the things that comes out a lot is her fear. Every time I call her, are you okay? That's the first, she doesn't ask, how are you doing? Are you okay? Is Patsy okay? Is Mike okay? My brother's had a hip replacement a couple of weeks ago. All she does is worry all the time. And as she, the, the further she gets into the dementia, the worse this gets. Now I will say this, keeps her on her knees praying for all of us all the time. 
Uh, Jack, let's read verses four to eight. But the Lord said to Gideon, there's still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will sift them for you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. All right, let's hang on for just a second. All right, you've already lost two thirds of your army. And now the Lord is telling you, you still got too many people. Let me sort them out for you. What do you think is going through Gideon's mind now? 10,000 probably seemed like a reach to defeat the, the camels and the Midianites. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, Jack. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. 300 men lapped with their hands to their mouths. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites to their tents, but he kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Uh, is there a little more there? Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. So... This is the same. I had to read this several times to understand what I was, what I was thinking here. Those who lap the water like a, do, like a dog. Okay. He's saying if they reach down with their hands, they pull it up to their mouth, and they start drinking the water like that. Those are the guys you're going to keep. The guys who kneel down by the stream, they're goners. Why? Gigi. Because uh, it's a... If they pick the water up to their mouth, they can still watch what's going on. It's more of a warrior type than mm -hmm. someone who's stuck their face in the water. Yeah, and if you read uh, any commentaries at all, that comes up a lot. People who are laying down on the ground, they're, they're not prepared. You could easily be attacked. Why else would you do that? Here's a very obvious answer. Because he wanted to. <laughs> He wanted to get the number so ridiculously low that Gideon, the Israelites, you and I, you could not come to any other conclusion than God provided the victory. God deliver, truly delivered them into his hands. And I think there's, it's interesting the way he has separated these people. Okay, first we get rid of the fearful. They're gone. Oh, and then we're going to get rid of the people that lay down on the ground to, to drink from a stream. I think it's very reasonable to think that those who stood up with their hands cupped and laughed like a dog probably were more attentive. But as we're going to see, I don't know that that really plays into, into the battle. telling the right criteria. Exactly. Instead of Gideon and him to say, God telling him, just pick 300 people, and then Gideon would have had a decision. That's right. That's right. And God knew how this was going to play out. You know, Tim Keller put it this way, Gideon should, should look back and think, the victory was God's, not mine. My only part was to trust and obey him. The glory is his and the privilege is mine. The 300 men should likewise say after the battle, it's impossible for us to win. Few as we were, this victory must have been given by God. The glory is his and the privilege is ours for being allowed to be a part of what he's doing. And the rest of Israel should think, I wasn't even there. God rescued me from doing anything. Praise him. So he tells them to proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart. So the 22,000 are down to 10. The 10 go down to 300. It was merely a way to divide the crowd. But like I said, God is trying to make this so abundantly obvious that you're only going to win by my hand. I don't want you boasting in your might. Now, there's 32,000 there that Gideon had. How many other uh, Israel people were there? How many other people were there? They're still living amongst the land. Quarter of a million? Half a million? This is just Gideon gathering up the 32,000. 
Uh, Jack, go ahead and read uh, verses uh, 9 to 11. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up, go down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant, Pura, and listen to what they are saying. After, afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outposts of the camp. Okay, so what are the two things that you notice here? He's afraid. He's afraid. Because God says, if you're afraid, take your buddy Pura with you, and you know, you'll feel better. And what does he do? He, he goes and gets Pura. So obviously Gideon is afraid. And God knows that. He didn't have to tell the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm still really skeptical about it. The Lord knows. And so he gives him an out. Hey, take your servant Pura to go with you. Verse 11, and you will hear what they say, and afterward, your hands will be strengthened. Pay attention to that, Jack. Uh, it's obvious that uh, Gideon is fearful right from the beginning. It's consistent from when he's hiding in the wine press. Uh, yeah. When he's asking, are you really God? And, and uh, it's just significant to me that God is willing to take his weaknesses, meet him where he is, and empower him in God's power to do what he needs to do. And I, I always remember that, that uh, line that, um, uh, gosh, who is Max Licato? He says, God will meet you exactly where you are. He just doesn't want to leave you there. And that's what he's doing with Gideon. Nelson Mandela once said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not, who, is not one who does not feel afraid, but who conquers that fear. And so Gideon is afraid, and God is helping him conquer that fear. Take your servant Pura with you. Jack 12 to 15. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley, thick as locusts. Their camels could no, longer, uh, could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Now, hang on a second. <laughs> Think about that statement. How many camels do you think there are there? This is crazy. You, he, he compares it to the sand on the shore. We're talking a lot of camels. All right, go ahead, Jack. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. And then 15. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped God. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, get up. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. So think about that. So first in verse 11, it says, you will hear what they say, and afterward, your hands will be strengthened. This is God telling me. Alvin. You know, I, from a standpoint of a man who is a soldier, first of all, the circumstances of his encounter is getting more bizarre as you go. But I'm not sure that anything more bizarre than this story and its interpretation. <laughs> so it is something God's doing to show him you're not going to understand what I'm going to do. You just do what I tell you. That's exactly right. And the thing of it is, so often we want to understand. If you'll just tell us what you're doing, if you just tell us, you know, he's, he's big time on not telling us. <laughs> yeah. Why, why is that? Because he wants us, he wants to keep us on our knees and in relationship with him. Remember we talked about in the first lesson, little by little. That's how God wants to bring things around, little by little. He didn't just say, here, Gideon, gather up 30,000 men, and we're going to go kick their butts in the Valley of Jezreel. Little by little. And this is another little by little right here with this strange dream. And, and then he gets the interpretation. But it pays, goes back to verse 11. You will hear what they say, and afterward your hands will be strengthened. So he's heard this strange dream. He's heard the interpretation. And what does he do? He bows down and worships God. Have you ever been so in awe of an answer to prayer that the only thing you can do is hit your knees and bow down 
and worship God. That's, that's a powerful image right there. And then I think this time with some conviction, he says, arise for the Lord has given the camp of Midian into your hands. I think there's a little conviction there now after hearing this. You know, when you read some, when you prepare for a lesson, you know, you read all kinds of stuff. I've read a couple of books and I've read some commentaries and some think that the ratio of Midianites to is Israelites was 400 to one. Okay. This is not a battle that's going to be won logically with 300 people. And I think it's at least that, that much. The loaf of barley bread. What is barley bread? Spurgeon says this is a, a bread that, that you usually feed to livestock and dogs. Okay. It's for the poor. And we talked about Gideon being a humble person. He was, he was poor in his pride. And that meant the vision meant that the camp of the Midianites would be knocked over by a humble nobody. And then there's nothing else but the sword of Gideon. God allowed Gideon to see a great confirmation of his future work. It's obviously no coincidence and no display of luck. God used the situation to build faith in Gideon, and it worked well that uh, Gideon could do, all he could do was worship God. It's no accident that the man dreamed the dream that night. It's no accident that he told a friend about it at that exact moment. And it's no accident that Gideon came to that exact place where he overheard the man telling the dream. Just like God said in verse 11, you're going to overhear this and your hand will be strengthened. It must have been a tremendous faith builder for Gideon to know that his enemies were afraid of him. When we're weak in faith, we often make our enemies stronger than they really are, don't we? You could say that the devil himself is afraid of the normal Christian, but at least afraid of what they could become anyway. You know, my nephew, um, former Marine, he got into a drug addiction after leaving the Marines. And when I say drug addiction, I'm not talking about opiates or anything else. I'm talking about heroin. I'm talking about selling anything and everything, beg, borrowing, stealing money to get your next fixed. And he came down to Louisville. They wanted him, they didn't want him to be in Wisconsin. They came down to Louisville to go to a rehab. And it was so his addiction was such that he got up at four o'clock in the morning to drive to Milwaukee, which is about an hour and 10 minutes from where they live, to get a final fix of heroin because he knew he could not make the eight hour trip in a car without it. But by the time he gets to rehab, he's, he's pretty messed up. But I asked him, he stayed with us for about six months after he got out of rehab. I asked him, you know, you've been to rehab before. What made this time different? And it was obvious we went to visit him within a couple of weeks. This was a different person. And so I said, How did, you know, it failed every time before. What was different than before? And he said, this time I brought God. And he really, really did. We spent six months talking about the Lord, talking about the Bible. He's a Catholic. He and his mother are probably the two finest Catholics I know. Um, but he's in the word, he reads, he loves Jesus. This time he brought God with him. And that made his weakness a strength. So we should take it to heart that our enemies, both human and spiritual, are at their core afraid of us, according to Spurgeon. Arise, the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hands. Gideon's encouragement was contagious. Having received encouragement, he could not help but spread the encouragement to others. And as we discussed, why do you think God gave him that dream to hear? Because he needed it. He needed that encouragement. He needed to be strengthened. God knew it. He told us that he knew it. And that's exactly what's happened. Has it ever happened to you before? You're fearful of a situation and then God gave you comfort or encouragement to get through that? What's that feel like? 
It feels awesome. What else? Relief. Strength. It takes the pressure off of you, doesn't it? If God has responded to you and he's provided comfort, he's provided encouragement, that takes some pressure off of your fears and your worries, doesn't it? Jack, let's uh, read verses 16 to 18. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Watch me, he told them, follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Now, I was a little slow on this slide, but this is the, the Valley of Jezreel today. It's a big place. If you look on that map, it goes quite a, quite a ways. I've actually been there. Dan and Meg took us there when we were visiting in uh, Israel a few years ago. But it's big. Imagine it filled with camels and Midianites. But look, it's all farmland. It's all farmland. That's because of all the camels. Are yeah, that's right. No shortage of fertilizer in the Valley of Jezreel. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right. So he divides the 300 men into groups of 100. He put trumpets. Now, this is how you arm your army. Put trumpets in one hand and empty pitchers in the other. Here we are. We are here to kick your tails, okay? With this pitcher and this torch. And then he tells them, we're going to come to the outskirts of the camp like I do. And when I and, and all who are with me blow the trumpet, then you also blow the trumpets around the camp. Now, this happened during the middle What We're going to see us here in a bit. The middle watch. This is about 10 o'clock at night. It's pitch black. Okay. Once you get that, that image in your head. And there's also no specific mention to about Gideon getting this revelation of how to attack them in the Bible. The only thing we know about Gideon is in Judges 6, it said he's a spirit-filled man. And when you're a spirit-filled man, you're probably following the leadings of the Holy Spirit. And that's probably what the Holy Spirit has told him to do in this case. And he looks and he says, look at me and do likewise. How many people say that to people around? Look at me and do likewise. Apostle Paul did. Usually it's uh, do as I say, not as I do. Right? But he's telling them, you do what I do. Jack, let's read um, uh, verses I might interrupt you, but let's go verses 19 to 25. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding the, their right hands, holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the 300 uh, trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. Okay, hang on a second here. Think, think about this now. Okay, we've we smashed some pots. <laughs> we have a torch. We're, but in the middle of the night, that had to be, oh, disorienting. And now they're coming out of their tents with their swords, or if they're not gathering up their families and fleeing, and they're doing what? They're killing each other. Because they're just, you're in the darkness, and if anything's moving, you're stabbing it. They're killing each other. Go ahead, Jack. The army fled to Beth Shittah toward Zerera, as far as the border of Abel Mahola near Tabath. Israelites from Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh were called out and they pursued the Midianites. Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites and seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as Beth Barah. 
So all the men, all the men of Ephraim were called out and they talk, were called out and they took the waters of the Jordan as far as Beth Barrow. So we get blasting trumpets, smashing pottery, people yelling the sword for the Lord and Gideon. It had to be an incredible, incredible impact on them. Have you ever been asleep at night and your security system goes off? Has that ever happened to you? Oh, alarm system? You've never had an alarm system go off in the middle of the night? You'll think about the story next time you do. Oh, I've had it happen, you know, and my first reaction is to wet myself and then have a heart attack <laughs> while I stumble to go find a gun. It is a real disorienting thing when you are sound asleep and all of a sudden something wakes you up. You don't know what to do. The other thing I've had, I was talking to Glenn earlier about having AFib. If I would be, I could be in perfect rhythm. And if I get startled awake in the middle of the night, my heart would instantly go into AFib. Man. John, I want to go back to something you said earlier because God did provide encouragement for Gideon, mm -hmm. but it starts way back in, in, in uh, Judges 6 where he says, uh, he, he greets him and says, oh, my oh, yeah. man of valor. Uh, it, it, it's almost uh, jokeable at that point, uh, but essentially it was also a prophetic statement that God was making. And so essentially God gave getting him what he needed along the way. But I, I think sometimes we miss the fact that getting Gideon actually had to be willing to be used of God, willing to follow God, willing, despite his fear, to act on God's behalf or with God's And, and in spite his view of God that he had abandoned Israel. That's exactly right. God, why is all this happening to us if, 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 if you're with us? Right. I think the point is for us is, that oftentimes that God can be leading us to do certain things and we say, no, no, that's not God. And, and, and we're not willing to do it. And therefore we miss incredible blessings. It's just like Esther. Uh, she was made for such a time as this. Yeah. But what did God, what, what, what did she learn? That if, if God wouldn't have used Esther, Esther would have been willing to be used. He would have found someone else to use. That's right. And I think a lot of times we miss that opportunity to be used of God because we're not willing to obey and to act and to follow him in spite of our fear. Yeah, and, and the other thing, uh, Bart has said this years ago in a lesson, I'll, I'll never forget it, and that is we are so resourceful ourselves, either through financial means or physical means or something else, that we don't allow ourselves to get in a predicament that only God can handle. It's possible that we don't always see the power of God because we're too quick to take care of things ourselves. Mari. And in this picture, their hands were full with a trumpet and a torch. Where was the sword? Exactly. They had no sword. Here we are. I'm here for battle. I got a torch and I got a, a pitcher. A lot of times during battles, their, their companies, well, only a few people would have the torch and the in the lantern so when you hear everybody has that probably oh, yeah. leads to the midianites like oh it's a greater number than what we thought and it caused more confusion as well yeah absolutely Mark. it also occurs to me you got 300 people and if there's a 400 to 1 ratio yeah. that valley was complete for miles it was still up most people aren't even going to hear those 300 people shouting yeah and so there's really <clears throat> It must have rippled all it through that army exactly. by itself under the guidance of God's angels. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a brilliant plan. It negates the size of the disparity between the, the armies. Israelites appear and sound far greater in size than they actually are. What do you think the camels did? <laughs> a little stampede. <laughs> Provided more fertilizer. Probably a stampede. I mean, that's just adding to the confusion. There's a reason the Bible re references the stupid camels again and again and again during this Gideon thing. It had to be a factor in part of this. Secondly, it negates the difference in strength. It makes the camels a non-factor. And like I said, they probably stampeded on out of there. And then beginning in verse 19, the attack is launched in earnest. The start of the middle of the watch at 10 o'clock. And they blew their horns. Can you picture being in a deep sleep and having that noise around you? Then you look out the tent 
or you wake up wherever you're sleeping and you see these torches all over. You're in a deep slumber, you had a hard day of pillaging crops, and suddenly the noise of 300 shofars interrupts the quiet desert. Like I said, if you've ever had an alarm go off in your house in the middle of the night, you'll know exactly what the Midianites <laughs> felt like. Up to this point, Gideon's 300 men hadn't even drawn their swords. Pots and torches. They're busy holding those things. Verse 21 says that every man, Israelite, stood in his place. And from there, they watched as men grabbed their wives and children and started running for their lives. The human locust took flight. And then this is the, the map here, just to give you an idea. Here's the Valley of Jezreel, right, right here, okay? This is where they're going in and they're coming in. Now the, they've, made, they've heard the, the trumpets blow and now you're gonna get more than 300 coming in, okay? And it says that he sent a messenger to Ephraim to cut them off down here. Beth Barah. In uh, the New Testament, they talk about where Jesus was baptized beyond Bethany. He was probably baptized in what is today modern day Jordan, and that would be right there. And that's where Ephraim cuts them off. Now let's uh, let's focus for a minute on the tale. These nomads are, are real people responding to a dangerous situation. They reacted just like people from any other society or era would. The same one for the Israelites. Midianites know that Gideon probably has 20 or 30,000 people. They also know that there could be a quarter of a million more Israelites coming. Not to mention a few Canaanites for that matter. And unlike us, when we sleep soundly because we trust our police and our military to protect us, no such condition existed in that day. You had guards, you had watches, and it was 24-7 for that. Glenn. I was going to say, somewhere, the Midianites, they have to be aware of what God has done in the past. Somewhere they got to wonder when the other shoe's going to fall. When oh, I think step up. So I mean that, and that's why they had that vision, the dream that one night that hey, God's going to come rescue. Them. So it was in the back of their minds. Hadn't seen it yet, but it was in the back of their minds. So the initial summons by Gideon to the war was to Manasseh, Asher, Naphtali. You can see all these Manasseh, Naphtali up here, Zebulun, Asher, and they can all converge down to that point where the battle is engaged. Verse 23 says, the flight of the enemy led to a general call of Israel to arms. And as you can imagine, everybody loves to join a rout and take some credit for the vengeful uh, enjoyment from it. So Hebrews from several tribes started pouring out of the woodwork. But another tribe was specifically solicited, and that's Ephraim. Why was Ephraim important? Because he had to send a messenger to him. The battle's up here, and it says that they fled to the east and the south. So they're coming down here. They're getting out of Dodge. Ephraim is right here, and they're going to cut them off. So I'm having some back problems. They're going to cut them off. and two of the key Midianite leaders were captured. And which verse was that? They captured two leaders of Midian, Oreb and Zeb, and they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and they killed Zeb at the wine press of Zeb. Why do you think they call them that? They probably weren't really called the wine press of Zeb or the rock of Oreb until they had their heads cut off and handed over to, to Ephraim. property and killed them. Oh, yeah. Maybe it really was. So two of the leaders are captured. And again, the names are the two places where they are executed. And 
depending on your point of view, those names might have become synonymous because they were killed there. Maybe they were really called that. I, I find it a little unusual to call a, a wine press the, the wine press of Zeb, unless of course it's his head that's uh, rolling in the wine press there. We're gonna switch over to chapter eight for a couple of verses. Jack, would you read the first, uh, I think it's the first three verses of chapter eight. Now the Ephraimites asked Gideon, why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us when, when you went to fight Midian? All right, this is exactly what we're talking about. Listen, if you'd have, know, if you'd have told me you're gonna go there and kick their rear ends, I'd like to have been a part of that. That's what they're really saying. They wanted to revel in the glory of, of victory. Go ahead, Jack. And they criticized him sharply, but he answered them, what have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleanings of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest of Abiezer? God gave Oreb and Zeb, the Midianite leaders, into your hands. What was I able to do compared to you? At this, their resentment against him subsided. Now, Ephraim's a, a, a powerful tribe in Israel. And Gideon called them out to help him cut off the Midianites as they're fleeing south. But they're unhappy. Why are they unhappy? Because they didn't get to be a part of the victory. You know, in college football, on a home game, I think you're allowed to dress 90, Lynn, is that right? 90 people on a home game for college football. You're allowed to dress 90 people. You get 90 people standing on the sidelines. How many do you think actually play? Maybe half. If you're lucky, maybe half. And if you route somebody, you've beaten someone 60 to nothing. You want to be on the field. You want to be able to bask in a little glory and not have to say, I was on the sideline of that. Okay. Remember the movie, Rudy? He got in like in the second to last play of the game or something, you know, just to say he was a part, a part of that. Why didn't you, you ever have someone say to you, why didn't you call me? I'd have came over and helped you move. <laughs> so you have had that happen. I was working, we're, we're getting new hardwood floors put in our bedroom and, and closet and we're having pets and I are working our tails off trying to get everything ready for that. And I'm doing all this drywall work and I, for a fleeting moment, I said, I'm gonna call Bart and see if he's got any uh, ideas. Maybe come over and, and help me. And I realized, no. Bart, he's, he's got enough. He's got enough. <laughs> so I chose not to, which by the way, when it comes to removing trim, that woman right there is, is incredible. I have a tendency where we're going to just start yanking on stuff, you know, and I'm poking holes in walls and stuff like that. And in 30 minutes, she gets all the molding out of there. My suitable helper. Yeah. Why didn't you call me? I would have liked to have been a part of that victory. There's, ironically, that reveals two truths. First, that God was absolutely correct that Israel would want to boast against him and glorify themselves in victory. Ephraim proves that. That's part of the reason why he chose Gideon the way he did. Because Ephraim would have loved to have been a part of that victory, would have loved to have boasted about it, and they wouldn't have had any thought about repenting to the Lord for early done. Second, Ephraim would not have respected or deferred to God's chosen judge. You think they would have followed Gideon in the battle? Probably not. And then Gideon, and this is the last lesson for today. Why didn't you call us? Why didn't you let us know? I mean, any, what does he do? He humbles himself again, and he says, hey, listen, you got the leaders. You, you did the heavy lifting. You got the two leaders down there, and, um, you know, we didn't do anything. What, what is my work compared to, to your work? It's nothing. Well, is that humility? What else is it? It's very discerning, for one. Paul said, as, long as, it as far as it depends on you, get along with everyone. And that's exactly what Gideon is doing here. He's letting himself take less glory. In fact, he knows it's all God's glory. And I'm just going to, I'm going to placate you 
just so we can diffuse a situation. And that's what he's done. And too often, when we're challenged in some significant way, we have a tendency to snipe back at people. You ever do that? You ever do it with your spouse? We probably do it with our spouses when we do other people because we feel comfortable enough doing that. We shouldn't do that. But that's exactly right. And Gideon is showing us his ultimate humility. He's also showing us that God made the right choice in choosing him to lead the people out of oppression. And then later, we'll get into this next, next week, they enjoy the beginning of 40 years of rest. So we're 300 to 350, 400 years of the judges. We've had two periods of 40 years of rest one period of 80 years and a lot of idolatry in between. So next week, we'll finish up our story of Gideon. And um, until then, Alvin, would you uh, lead us in prayer?